So in our last video, we were talking about contrast therapies, specifically temperature regulation. So heat therapies versus cold therapies, let's say sauna versus ice bath, as an example, and understanding how to view contrast therapies through the hormetic lens. We're doing a series on hormesis. We're still talking about contrast therapies, but now we're gonna talk about hyperoxia, increasing our oxygen levels versus hypoxia, decreasing our oxygen levels, and how to look through oxygen therapies through that same hormetic lens. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this video on hormesis. So if you're just finding this video, this is video five of a series that we've been doing ultimately on hormesis. How do we view all of these different therapies, modalities, and programs through the hormetic lens? The reason that that's important is that helps us guide people safely and effectively through a program of care. So if you haven't seen the first four videos, absolutely watch the first video, which explains in detail the sources of stress, the effect that stress has on our body, and how to use stress to understand the hormetic concept. I would then say it's best to watch the other four videos because ultimately we started with a concept overview of hormesis, and how to apply hormesis to our health. And we've been building on that information, going through different strategies along the way, but ultimately each one of those videos will build on new concepts that will make this video make a lot more sense. So watch those first and then come on back to this one so we can fill in the gap and how we can view oxygen through that same hormetic lens. So when it comes to oxygen therapies, there's really three very distinct pathways that oxygen can affect our body. One is, by increasing the amount of oxygen and using oxygen ultimately as a fuel for cells to create energy. Another distinct pathway is that oxygen is oxidative. In other words, literally increasing the oxygen inside our body increases the amount of oxidation we're being exposed to. There are benefits of oxidation and there are consequences of oxidation. For more information on that, we've done a few videos on the oxidative effect of oxygen, the oxidative effect of hyperbaric. So please check those videos out. But I do want to bring up the fact that oxygen being oxidative also is a stressor, which means it fits this conversation about hormesis. And the third pathway is by actually lowering our oxygen levels, we become hypoxic, even if it's just mildly hypoxic or relatively hypoxic, which I'll cover in a few minutes. And hypoxia is actually a stimulant for many, many benefits of repair and regeneration of tissue. So if we look at the continuum of oxygen from hyperoxia and high levels of oxidation to hypoxia and low levels of oxidation, we can now view that continuum and we can understand the continuum of hypoxia to hyperoxia, all the different effects what tools do we have to stimulate those different ends of the spectrum? And again, how do we view that entire process through the hormetic lens to make sure that number one, we're getting the effect that we want, number two, we're improving health over time, and number three, we're keeping either ourselves, our family, our clients, or our patients safe throughout that entire journey. So let's just focus this conversation on hyperbaric for right now. And let's say that when you go into a chamber, because of the increased atmospheric pressure, because of the increased percentage of oxygen, you are becoming hyperoxic. We are increasing the amount of oxygen going into your body, ultimately being delivered to your cells and mitochondria. So that's the hyperoxic side of the continuum. When you get out of the chamber, you're now not being exposed to increased atmospheric pressure. Your body's starting to come back to baseline. And as the oxygen is trying to get out of your body, you do have oxygen sensors on your cells and those oxygen sensors are reading the fact that oxygen is rapidly leaving your body. What that's creating is what's called relative hypoxia. You're not actually becoming hypoxic, but it is signaling a very similar pathway as if you were. There are some very well-known benefits of hyperoxia, and there are some very well-known benefits of hypoxia. And even if you looked at the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen, some of those benefits are from the increased oxygen you're getting, but many of those benefits are actually hypoxic related benefits. So we know that during that relative hypoxia, we are stimulating hypoxic pathways. Even just using the hyperbaric chamber alone, we are able to manipulate that hyperoxia hypoxia continuum. We can go a little further and we could also say that 
going up in elevation is one way to create hypoxia. As you go up in elevation, you lose atmospheric pressure. Somebody living in Denver has less atmospheric pressure than somebody living in Miami. And that person is mildly hypoxic. And so the body tries to adapt to that. Because of loss of atmospheric pressure, that person's body's registering hypoxia, which stimulates HIF-1, hypoxic inducible factor. So that person living in Denver is mildly hypoxic. The body registers lower oxygen levels. That stimulates HIF-1-alpha, which is hypoxic inducible factor, which then stimulates a series of adaptations so that that person can live in Denver and still be a healthy human, which ultimately stimulates increased red blood cell number so that we have more delivery systems to carry the oxygen that that person is inhaling and still be able to deliver it to our cells and our mitochondria. Many of you have also probably seen either oxygen restricted masks or oxygen deprivation tents, ways of creating mild levels of hypoxia because we do know that there's a lot of benefits to exposing people to hypoxia. So we have hyperbaric on one end of that spectrum, creating increased levels of oxygen, and then we have strategies for inducing hypoxia, which takes us even further down the continuum into hypoxia. The further we push somebody in terms of increased pressure and increased percentages of oxygen, the further increased hyperoxia we can create. But just because we can do it doesn't mean we need to do it or doesn't mean it's in the person's best interest. So just because we could do three atmospheres of pressure doesn't mean that that's the best choice for that person. We need to understand how to expose people to different amounts of increased oxygen to support and build their health. Likewise, just because humans can be hypoxic and survive doesn't mean we want to create constant and extreme levels of hypoxia because there's many consequences to hypoxia over the long haul. So this is another version of a contrast type of therapy that we can use the hormetic curve to best understand how far we should push somebody in either direction to get all the benefits we're looking for, to improve their health, and without pushing either end of that spectrum too far, causing more damage than benefit. So one way to consider this would be the way we handle hyperbaric, let's say, in our clinics or in the clinics that we teach, which is we always start at lower pressure. Now, that person may need higher pressure, but I want to make sure that they're going to tolerate that. So we start at lower pressures, and then we build pressure over time after a series of sessions, which does two things. Number one is it allows us to pre-treat them. So if there are going to be issues handling higher pressure, each exposure is like a hormetic boost. So each exposure allows us to improve the response so that the next exposure is going to be more appropriate. If we take someone to two and a half atmospheres on 100% oxygen and they've never been in a chamber, that could certainly be too big of a boost for their first session. And so we like to do it strategically because if there's going to be an issue, we'd like to see that issue at a lower pressure. It's going to be a smaller problem. So we use the hormetic concept to build their exposures over time until we get to the pressure that we want them to be at, and then we can treat them for a series of sessions at that pressure. The same would go on the hypoxia side. If you have a tool that creates hypoxia, there are benefits to that, but we shouldn't go to the furthest extreme possible. We should start at mild hypoxias, let them get back to baseline, and continually expose that person to greater amounts of hypoxia, making sure that their body responds and rebounds back to that baseline successfully. One of the things that I love about hyperbaric specifically is it has the capacity to do both. It has the ability to create that hyperoxia, and when you get out of the chamber or when you take an air break, it does create this relative temporary hypoxia situation, but without actually ever becoming hypoxic. In other words, we can use lower levels of hyperbaric oxygen to get all the benefits of hyperbaric, and by taking air breaks and coming out of the chamber and doing repetitive sessions, we can stimulate hypoxic pathways without ever becoming hypoxic. So we can keep people in a really safe range of hyperoxia and hypoxia without getting anywhere near the levels of oxygen that could stimulate things like oxygen toxicity and reap the benefits of hypoxia without actually ever inducing real hypoxia. And so we're getting the benefits of both and we're minimizing the consequences simultaneously. That's one of the reasons that I think hyperbaric is a superior therapy from a contrast of hyperoxia and hypoxia.
That being said, there's always going to be people that want to push that envelope. And so how do we do it? We do it the same way we would with temperature regulation. So if you didn't see that video, please go ahead and watch that. But from an oxygen standpoint, we can still say, listen, I need you to show me that you can tolerate increasing levels of hyperoxia, increasing levels of pressure and oxygen, and you can return to baseline. And we could do that and expand your health simultaneously. I would then expose somebody strategically to increasing amounts of hypoxia with increasing frequencies and duration, making sure that they could return back to baseline without any issues. And that regardless of which way we went, we're coming back to baseline and we're seeing proof of improved health over time. That proof can include improved heart rate variability, improved deep sleep, improved REM or sleep quality overall. It would include things like improved immune system function, reduced inflammation. All the things that they're coming in for in the first place are resolving. If we start this process, we're seeing some improvements and all of a sudden we're pushing the limits and now we're seeing a decline in health. We've gone too far. Once we could push hyperoxia strategically and successfully and hypoxia strategically and successfully, then we can start ping-ponging between hyperoxia and hypoxia if we want to, to try to create a larger swing. Again, starting with a smaller pendulum and then increasing that distance of pendulum swing as the patient, client, or yourself show proof that they're becoming healthier, they're becoming more resilient, and they're adapting to those swings. Now, I'm just going to add one more thought to this, which is depending on what type of hyperbaric you're using and what percentage of oxygen somebody is breathing, when we talk about these pendulum swings, it's one thing to go from a state of hypoxia and a low pressure of oxygen and then swing all the way through the continuum to higher pressures of oxygen, higher atmospheric pressure, higher percentages of oxygen. It's safe to go that way. An example of that would be it's safe to go in an airplane, which is a low pressure of oxygen environment, spend hours there, land at the surface, and then go scuba diving. So you went from relative hypoxia to the surface and then to hyperoxia, which at the end of the day, scuba diving is an increased atmospheric and increased oxygen type of scenario. It is not okay to come from scuba diving back to the surface and then jump in an airplane, especially if you've been getting a lot of nitrogen in that process. So if we're talking about oxygen swings, unlike temperature swings where you can go from heat therapies to cold or from cold to heat, there's different benefits for swinging both ways, but there's not a lot of consequences or safety issues. That is not true with pressures of oxygen. When it comes to pressures of oxygen, especially if you're breathing air, which is predominantly nitrogen, you can go from hypoxia to hyperoxia very safely but you really need to know what you're doing and or to avoid it completely to go from high levels of oxygen, high pressures of oxygen to hypoxia. You do not want to swing in that direction. So I just want to make sure that that's crystal clear for those of you that are going to start pushing the envelope that way. Also, please just make sure you're not swinging the pendulum either way until you've worked your way through the hormetic curve, allowing yourself ample opportunity to adapt to both ends of that spectrum until you start swinging through from one end to the other. I hope that helps you understand the, the contrast between hyperoxia and hypoxia, and then how to look at oxygen through the hormetic curve. The next video, which is video six, in video six we're gonna be covering viewing fasting through the hormetic lens. So how do we take a very common and popular therapy right now, fasting, and make sure that you're doing it in a way that's effective, you're getting the benefits, and you're not pushing it too far or too fast, to exceed your body's capacity to reap the benefits of all that hard work you're doing. Thanks for your time and attention. Don't forget to subscribe. Make sure you get notified when that video six comes out. And please, if you haven't already, check out the others in this series. We'll see you next time.